on everybody. Yeah. I want you to put your hands together. Yes, sir. Jump up on your feet. This is a celebration. Let's, Let's go. go. that in order to receive forgiveness and a fresh start with God, we must repent of our sins, believe in Jesus, who was conceived by God the Father through the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary's womb. Therefore, he's the Son of God, and commit to his will for our lives. We believe that Christ is the head of the church. We believe that the Holy Spirit gives gifts to all believers for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. We are a Bible-believing church. We believe that the Bible is the only pattern for worship. We believe in the power and significance of the church and the necessity of believers to meet regularly together. What's up, family? Pastor Cohen here. Listen, I have a quick announcement. Uh, anybody who would love to help with the organization and setup and carry out of Hallelujah Night, I'm talking to you. I want to meet with everybody who is interested in contributing um, on Saturday, this coming Saturday at 1130 a.m. in the Multipurpose Room. If you're interested in Hallelujah Night and you want to be a part of it and help uh, with any of the preparation or the carrying out of what's going on, meet me on Saturday. 
Saturday at 11.30 a.m. in the multi-purpose room, all right? Until then, God bless. Good evening, family. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Tuesday evening Bible study right here at Dayspring, where we are training leaders for the next generation through a process that we call the FEX Effect, and that includes fellowship, evangelism, conversion, training, and service. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Bible study here tonight where we are ready to take another deep dive into the Word of God. But before we get started, my name is Pastor Cohen and I'm here to welcome and invite each and every one of you in, whether you're here in house or you're enjoying the digital experience. Welcome everybody. Um, before we get started, please do us a favor and make sure that you share this live with everyone that you know. In addition to that, click that thumbs up button for us as it helps to uh, engage the algorithm and spread the gospel message of Jesus all around the globe. Thank you so much for doing that. All right, I'm going to wrap this up so we can get over to the sanctuary and get this thing going. Y'all stay tuned.
being our ever-present help. Thank you, Father, for all the blessings that you have prepared for us for this season of life. We thank you, Father, for touching these bodies, making them whole and complete. We thank you for your healing, and we thank you for your deliverance. God, we thank you for opening our minds to receive and understand. And God, we give you praise for it. Now, Father, we ask your kingdom come as your will is being done in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Bibles this evening. Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6. Finally got something that's going to be easy on the mind. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6. Verse 19 says this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the lamp of the body is the eye, if therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if the eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. One more. <laughs> no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else... He will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Amen. 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 All right, you can be seated. We talked this morning, this evening, about the, how we are not to be distracted by money. <laughs> Don't be distracted by money. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. I want you to notice that the, uh, the way the scripture is written and the way that, that Jesus was delivering this, you see verses 19 through 21 talks about treasures in heaven. 22 and 23 talks about the, the eye being the lamp on the body. And then it talks about serving two masters. And the reason it's broken up that way is because if 22 and 23 are not understood in the light of 19 and 21, then you'll end up serving two masters. Let me read something to you. I like these stories that I run across. I always have to print them out so I can read them. It says, Mrs. Ber Bertha Adams was 71 years old when she died alone in West Palm, Palm Beach, Florida on Easter Sunday, 1976. The coroner's report read, cause of death, malnutrition. After wasting away to 50 pounds, she could no longer stay alive. When the state authorities uh, made their preliminary investigation of her home, they found a veritable pig pen, the biggest mess you can imagine. One seasoned inspector declared that he had never seen a dwelling in greater disarray. Bertha had begged for food from her neighbor's door and had gotten clothes from the Salvation Army. From all appearances, she was a penniless recluse, a pitiful forgotten widow. But such was not the case. Amid the jumble of her filthy, disheveled belongings were found two keys to safe deposit boxes at two different banks. The discovery was unbelievable. The first box contained 700 AT&T stock certificates. That's before AT&T was a phone company. <laughs> the 
There were a phone company, but not a cell phone company. I'm trying to make the distinction there. It says, plus hundreds of other valuable notes, bonds, and solid financial securities, not to mention cash amounting to $200,000. The second box had no certificates, just cash, 600000 to be exact. Bertha, Bertha Adams was a millionaire and then some, yet she died of starvation. Her case was even more tragic if she was destitute spiritually. Now, some of y'all say, wow, that's a terrible thing. Terrible thing. But I, I, I mentioned to you on Sunday how some people just have money so they can have money. And then they die. Now, first of all, we know your children ain't going to just have money. I think y'all have figured that out. <laughs> what they're going to have is fun with your money. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, I want to just give you some, some quick information because I know everybody knows this, and this scripture, this lesson is not about giving. Okay? So you, you can hold on. It don't have, don't have to be any hard breathing. This is... <laughs> This is trying to explain something. The Bible teaches us this. It says that as human beings, we're accustomed to living life uh, divided into two areas, spiritual and material, or spiritual and natural, or spiritual and physical, whichever you, know, you, you prefer. But the Bible teaches that Jesus made no distinction. He did not... He didn't look at people whether they had or did not have. Uh, our attitude toward wealth is a barometer of our righteousness. In other words, how you treat money, not how you feel about it, is, is the barometer to your righteousness. Now, money is a medium of exchange. I think we need to understand that. Money that's stagnant doesn't benefit anybody. In order for people to prosper, money must be in motion. You understand that? You can do more uh, for people if money is active. Yeah. Sitting it in the bank doesn't benefit anybody but you. Not that that's a bad thing. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. You ought to have some in the bank, too. But, but money is designed to uh, advance the kingdom of God. And advancing means that, and well, Jesus said it this way. He says, occupy Till I come. In other words, there ought to be some activity. It shouldn't be a hoarding. Amen? Amen. Oh, that's good. That's good. So the Bible goes on to say this. Said the Pharisees believed that the Lord materially blessed the ones that he loved. That's why they tried to get all the money they could get. They were intent on uh, building great treasures on earth. But the treasures built there were subject to decay. And that's what the word says that moth destroy and rust destroys. One, 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 <laughs> one commentary says, I love this. I'm going to look away from my wife. says that in Job, it says that, that they moth eat up dresses. <laughs> I said, that's because they send them to Never mind. <laughs> I just thought it was odd that it didn't say they ate up suits. And most brothers know that the, what happened to suits is that somebody goes in and switches them out for a different size. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's not, that's not. <laughs> So <laughs> the Bible says that, that uh, treasures deposited in heaven can never be lost. In James chapter 5, here's what the Bible says. It says in verse 2, your riches are corrupt, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is corroded, 
and their corrosion will never be a witness, uh, will, excuse me, will be a witness against you and eat your flesh, eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures for the last days. Uh, you can't hold on to it. No matter how hard you try, you can't hold on to it. If you don't use it, somebody else is going to. Okay. All right. The Bible says a better investment would be in the kingdom. Amen. Because that investment is eternal and imperishable. Amen. So he makes it clear that a right attitude toward wealth is a mark of true spirituality. The right attitude. Now, we're still talking about the attitude because you need to understand that when we talk about money, a lot of people think a certain way about it. And they feel like that at some point in time, you will have enough that you can be liberal. But if you don't have the liberal spirit, it doesn't matter how much you have or you don't have. The Bible says the Pharisees were covetous people. Look at Luke chapter 16. It says, now the Pharisees were lovers of money. They loved money. Now, that's the wrong attitude. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And these Pharisees used uh, religion to make money. Now, a lot of people, oh, I can't talk about that, can I? Yeah, let me take a stab at it. A lot of people... Uh, Can't say it without offending somebody. <laughs> Let's just say a lot of churches are not real churches. Amen. And they're in it for. Okay. All right. I, I'm going to leave that alone. I ain't going to talk no more about it. So if we have true righteousness of Christ in our lives, then uh, we'll have a proper attitude toward material wealth. Store your treasures where you want your heart to be. Okay. Can I ask you? Store your treasures where you want your heart to be. Store your treasures. If you think that you love the bank, put it in there. Mm -hmm. But there may be some of the other things you love. Might be some people you love. Amen. If you spend more uh, or you take more of your money and put it away than you spend on your, your say, your wife, there's something, something wrong with that picture. Amen. Amen. It's easier to give it to her and let her decide if she wants to put it in the bank. Amen. Amen. Oh, ain't that many brothers in here tonight, is it? <laughs> oh. The idea is, is that, brother, so, you know, you all remember this, that they'll always multiply. Amen. All right? Yeah, they can do a whole lot more with it than you can. And that's all I'm going to say on that one. <laughs> so the Bible says if we, if we, if we put our money uh, in Christ, then we'll have the right attitude toward material wealth. So here's what the Bible says. Your heart will always follow your treasure. What I care about, what I love, is shown by the priority. It's a, the priority of how I utilize God's gift. Amen. Which means that no matter how much I receive, I have to remember that I have to share. Amen. It is, you know, a People, people ask this question, uh, not y'all. Those uh, uh, French Christians, y'all know what I'm talking about? French Christians. You know, they, they save when it matters, but they're kind of worldly when it doesn't matter. Well, these people always ask the question somewhere around March or April, <laughs> do I have to tithe on my refund. Hmm? I'm not trying to answer that question. What I'm trying to say is that 
whatever comes into your hand. I mean, it didn't just come out of that. Well, maybe it did. It just came from the post office, right? You don't know where that money came, right? No, you know where it came. <laughs> the idea is that you know that it is an increase. It's money you didn't have the day before. And that's that. that mm, mm, mm. It's good when y'all know all this stuff, but I can just go right on through this. So nowhere did Jesus magnify poverty or criticize legitimate wealth. God made all things, including food, clothing, and precious metals. That means, you know, because some of y'all like gold, diamonds, and all that stuff. God declares that all things were made, uh, that he made was good in Genesis 1 and 31. God knows that we need certain things to live, Matthew 6, 32. So he's laid it all out for us. In fact, he's given us, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6 and 17, he says that he has given us, well, let's just read it. Command those who are rich in this present age, not to be haughty, but, uh, uh, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to do what? Enjoy. That right there tells us that money has a purpose. It should bring you joy. Most of us get some. Most of us get so much joy that we don't want to let it go. <laughs> so the Bible goes on to say that Jesus warned against the sin of living for the things of this life. In other words, everything that we invest in should be something that's going to have eternal benefits. Uh, he pointed out the sad consequences of covetous, covetousness and idolatry. Now, the two things go together, and I, I I'll show that to you in just a few minutes when we explain to you what mammon is. But people who are idolaters covet money. Let me wait till I get there, okay? Uh, so materialism will enslave the heart, the mind, and the will. We can become shackled by the material things of life, but we ought to be liberated and controlled by the Spirit of God. Money shouldn't have you. You should have money. Y'all still with me? See, is this fun? So far, it's fun. Seriously, I'm not, I'm not going to teach on giving tonight. No. So he says, uh, <laughs> so we're talking about enslaving the heart, the mind, and the will. So let's take them one at a time. The first one is the heart. If the heart loves material things and puts earthly gain above heavenly investment, then the result is a tragic loss. In other words, the Bible says this way, if you try to hold on to it, you lose it. All right. So the heart in scripture refers to the sin of one's being. It includes emotions, reason, and will. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. Let me see here. It says, my son, pay attention to my words. Incline uh, your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence for what? Out of it springs the issues of life. All right? So the Bible goes on to say the eye, similar to the heart, is a lamp that reveals the quality of a person's inner life. The treasures on earth may be used for God, but we gather material things for ourselves. Now the Bible says that... Uh, we will lose them, and we will lose our hearts with them. If you get tied up with money and your heart is in being selfish or covetousness, the Bible says not only will you lose what you're trying to hold on to, but you lose your heart in the process because your heart's not with God. Amen. The more 
we work to get for ourselves, the more our relationship with God decreases. The more you do for you, the less you can do for God. Y'all still with me? So instead of spiritual enrichment, uh, we experience impoverishment. So the Bible says uh, 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 when we talk about laying up treasures in heaven, it means that we have to use all that we have for the glory of God. Now, it means to hang loose when it comes to material things. In other words, you have to hold natural things loosely. Doesn't matter, you know. I I I, uh, I like old cars, so I'm always reading stuff about them. And uh, every year, as a matter of fact, next week they have uh, an auction in uh, Ohio. They go all around the country. They auction off these uh, vintage cars. So th today I happened to be flipping through, and they had one as a 1964 Pontiac GTO. Before they looked like the judges, old, old, old school. And uh, I was, it was in pristine condition. Now, here's what I want to show you. You can't enjoy the car and keep it that way at the same time. The cars are not made to look at. But if you use them for the intended purpose, it goes away eventually. So whenever I see one that's preserved like that, you realize, you, you look at it, because we're talking about a car that's over 50 years old. But it means that you look at the odometer, it's probably got less than 10,000 miles on it. Well, it only goes from show to show. And they put it on a trailer, take it off, drive it to it. A lot of us take our valuables the same way. We make museum pieces out of them, which means they don't, become useful to anybody. We just like to look at them. Okay. All right. The Bible says, and uh, it means that we're measuring life by the riches of the kingdom and not the false riches of the world. Nobody should ever be able to look at you and tell how much money you have. Okay. The second thing is, now that was the heart. The Bible says, the second, materialize not, materialism not only enslaves the heart, but it also enslaves the mind. Uh, verse 23 gives us that information. God's word often uses the eye to represent the attitude of the mind. If the eye is properly focused on light, the body can function properly in its movement. Y'all get that? But if the eye is out of focus and seeing double, then the results is unsteady. We have to understand something. If our spiritual sight is off, then we don't get the cues from the Holy Spirit that we're supposed to receive. It, if we don't get the right information, then the decisions we make are going to be wrong. So what he's saying is then when he talks about the eye being the light of the person, then I'm a little unsteady if I can't see well. And if I have double vision, I'm always going to be bumping into something. So the Bible goes on to say this, it's difficult, difficult to make progress while trying to look in two directions at the same time. Amen? 
So what is he saying? If your goal is to make money and have material things, you're looking one way. If your goal is to please God and give to his kingdom, then you're looking another way. So in order for you to be stable, you got to look one way or the other. Amen. 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 So <laughs> the Bible says, uh, if your goal is to get material gain, then uh, it'll mean darkness. But if your outlook is to serve and glorify God, then there'll be light within. So the Bible says that uh, if what should be light is really darkness, then you're being controlled by the darkness and the outlook determines the outcome. Here's what happens. When the Bible says that, that when the darkness gets into the eye, let me read that scripture to you. The Bible says uh, in verse 23, it says, if the eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Now, here's what he's saying. Very simply, there are some people who because of their wrong view or wrong attitude about money and success, see everything negatively. The more you work at trying to accomplish something for yourself, the more your attitude drifts toward the negative side. That's why so many people today, uh, if, you, if you get something, if you buy a new car, a new outfit, a new something, they'll find something wrong with the outfit or the car or whatever. But well, that's a nice car, but I would have bought. And the reason is because they are so uh, 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 self-focused that everything they see is going to be negative. So everything they say is going to be negative. Amen. Amen. So finally, number three, the third thing is the will. We said the, the heart, uh, the mind. Now we're talking about the will. Verse 24 gives us that. It says, we cannot serve two masters simultaneously. Mammon refers to wealth, money, or prosperity. Mammon is the name given to an idol worshipped as the god of riches. That's where I was showing you idolatry causes us to have some issues because worshiping mammon or the god of money creates a problem for us. Uh, the Bible says it's the same uh, god Plutus among the Greeks. This means that you can't serve the true god uh, and at the same time be completely engaged in obtaining riches of this world. We must be, uh, we must, inter uh, excuse me, interfere. One, one must interfere with the other. When you're serving both God and mammon, one's got to cross over somewhere. You all, listen, we all start out serving God. And we always start out full bore. And the problem is, the re listen, the reason we can't keep it up is because God blesses us. Because when you're making $100 a week, you, you right on it. But when you get blessed to get $1,000 a week, now you got some problems. Isn't it amazing? You're making 10 times more money but somehow you just don't have enough to give God any. Now, no, have no fear. He's a just God. He'll bring you right back to 100 where you're comfortable. Oh, yeah. I've seen it many times. <laughs> so the Bible says uh, <laughs> the sin of idolatry is as dangerous as uh, hypocrisy. No one can serve two masters because there will come a time when uh, they will make opposing demands. <laughs> yeah. See, there again, there's going to come a time when your money and your worship are going to collide. 
There's a funny thing about being in, in, in real worship. When you really engage with God, he starts talking to you. Now, y'all know the rest of that story. When God start talking to you, he start telling you what you ought to do. And you be talking about the devil then. Get, get the hint, say, no. Nah. Because <laughs> you don't want to be hearing all that. I understand that. I do. I think he does too. Amen. <laughs> so either Jesus is our Lord or money is our Lord. It's a matter of the will. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare. That's in 1 Timothy 6 and 9. Now, uh, if God grants riches and we use them for his glory, then the riches are a blessing. But if we will to get rich, in other words, we're doing it for the money, and live uh, with that outlook, we'll pay a price for the riches. Money costs you. Listen, let me, if you use money improperly, it will cost you more Amen. than what you had to begin with. Amen. You can mess it up. But it costs you not only to pay it back, but whatever penalty that comes from You know, I, I, y'all, well, y'all probably ain't had no tax issues, so you don't know anything about it. But years ago, I had some, so I know about that. And, and it's one thing to have to pay the money back. It's a whole other thing to have to give, just give them money because you messed up. It just, Trump ain't right about that, but. Yeah, let's go on. We're about at the end here. <laughs> the light is the lamp of the body. Uh, excuse, light is the lamp of the body. Uh, and it's the eye that, we, that sees who we are. If, therefore, the eye is single, simple, and clear, as applied to the outward eye, it means that we have general soundness. What does that mean, soundness? It means we can make a right decision, particularly not looking in two ways. This is what he does not want us to do. So he says the mind's eye then uh, 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 must be singleness of purpose, looking right at the object, right at right, not right at, but right at the object. Y'all don't? Looking directly. Yeah, somebody said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got to remember my audience, right? Uh, at, at its, uh, as, as its object, and it, as opposed to having two ends in view. Now, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25, it says, let your eyes look straight ahead and let your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your, feet, your foot from evil. Amen. If you're on assignment for God, he's given you clear direction. Then you need to keep your eye on your destination. The moment you start to look to the left or to the right, you're going to see something that's going to create problems for you. And that distraction is what we say is what keeps you from enjoying the benefits of God. Money becomes then a distraction. So either you let the light in through your eyes or you remain in darkness unless your spiritual a perspective is directed by God, you'll wander in the dark. Amen. A bad eye, or what we consider impaired vision, suggests moral corruption. 
In other words, if your eye is bad, uh, everything you're going to think about is bad, not just in money, but everything else in life. A healthy eye or clear vision suggests loyalty and devotion to God. Few things can distract our spiritual focus and full, fill us with darkness as effective as becoming a slave to money. Uh, and, you know, it's almost like we become spiritual gamblers. You know how gamblers are. You, you, you keep doing all this stuff so you can come back to even and then get ahead. So what they'll do is they'll borrow big, steal, whatever you got to feed their habit, hoping that when they hit, you'll, be, you'll benefit from it. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> so here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the conclusion. Having money is not the problem. I need to talk about that for just a minute because too many people believe that money is bad. Money is not bad. Money is good. Money is good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there ain't no ifs, ands, and buts about it, you know. The problem is it's, it's your attitude toward the money. The more that you have, the more you can do for others. And it's always got to be that way. Amen. Amen. We were sitting at home looking at the thing flash across the screen. It says the Powerball drawing tonight is $1.2 billion. And I asked her right quick. I said, what's the title on that? <laughs> Million two, right? Mm-hmm. But the point is, listen, listen, listen. If you hit that, not the trouble gamble, but if you hit that, <laughs> I promise you the first thing you do is you start backtracking. Well, I know it was 1.2 million, but I didn't get that much. I only, I, I only got 300 million, uh, you know. Uh, huh? So now all of a sudden, 1.2 million becomes a problem because you only got three out of the 1.2 billion. Huh? What he say? Whatever, whatever. Uh, Y'all know I'm not a mathematician now. Eh? I, uh, <laughs> I ain't never told anybody I majored in math. <laughs> whatever, whatever it was, whatever he said. <laughs> but understand something. What I'm, what I'm saying to you is that now it becomes a problem. And it will always be a problem when your mind is focused on money rather than God. But now, all of a sudden, if you are really saved, you know, playing the lottery, and uh, <laughs> now remember what I told y'all about the lottery. Did y'all remember what I said? Let me say it again to you. It's a matter of conscience. It doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother me. Bother me if you hit and didn't pay, but. <laughs> No, seriously, uh, it's the attitude. Now, uh, the danger is when the physical becomes more important to you than the spiritual. That's where you can't serve two, ma two masters. Because if God has already told you what to do with the money, so you're very, listen, now l let me tell you all this. You can read these statistics for yourself. A majority of lottery winners are broke in six months. You know why they're broke, right? 
a fool and his money will soon part. You understand that? So don't think I'm going to be different. No, if you try to rob God, you are not going to be immune. You're going to have some issues. God must have your devotion if you are to receive kingdom direction. Now, what are we saying? If you're not tuned into God, you have no connection to God, you're not going to hear from God. If you're not going to hear from God, you're going to make some mistakes. That, 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 your decisions are going to be off. When you should have given this, you, should, you didn't. When you should have invested in that, you didn't. Well, what you did is you invested in you, Mm -hmm. And James says it this way. James says you have not because you ask not and you don't get the ass right because you're asking wrong. And if you ask wrong, the Bible says you're not going to get it because the Bible says he knows you're going to spend it on your pleasures. Amen. 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 So title, don't be distracted by money. The distraction is, 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 is because your attitude is, is off about money. Money is good. Money is used for a medium of exchange. If I give you money, you give me this, and we continue to do this. You know, if, 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 if money was not available to establish manufacturing companies, people wouldn't have jobs. Come on. If money was not available to send people to medical school, there wouldn't be people who were making breakthroughs in science. Money is necessary, but it's your attitude toward it. Amen. You notice that most hospitals have a Christian name? Mount Sinai, Bethesda. Yeah. Most of y'all say, we ain't been to no hospital. <laughs> At any rate, what I'm saying is because churches invest heavily in uh, medical facilities. There are a lot of other philanthropical uh, uh, entities that you can put your money in but it should always do something that benefits other people. It shouldn't be something that's just looking out for you. Amen? All right, come on, stand up on your feet. That was painless, wasn't it? All right, family, we pray that you got something out of this tonight that you could grow from and become a better kingdom citizen. Thank you for rocking with us tonight. Listen, you guys have an amazing week. And just in case your week is not so amazing, make sure it has an amazing you in it. Until we get together again, God bless you. We love you. And we can't wait to see you next time.